Allah Rahman Rahim. <coughs> uh, today I'll be discussing the subject of uh, Maqasid al Sharia, the goals and purposes of Sharia. If we replace this la the second word, we can easily say the goals and purposes of Islam itself. It would not be inaccurate. Maqasid al Sharia is a subject that has invoked a renewed interest in recent decades. Uh, there is a plethora of writings, articles, books, conferences, PhDs on the subject of Maqasid. A jurisprudence of Maqasid is in the making, partly because the Maqasid are versatile. They relate more directly to uh, to human life situation and uh, also provides perhaps a more accessible approach to the resources of the Sharia compared to usul al fiqh to the science and doctrines of Islamic jurisprudence. And I will explain a little about that. It is partly because the usul al fiqh has become a little overburdened with technicalities. It is a very, very well-developed aspect of the Sharia, yet so well-developed that sometimes it can be uh, a little further removed from the objectives of legislation in lawmaking in our times. <clears throat> uh, it also provides the maqasid uh, perhaps more accessible tools for legislation in ijtihad. I will be uh, looking also to some extent at the weaknesses of the maqasid. One of the main points of weaknesses that critics have highlighted is that the methodology of the maqasid is not as well developed as uh, those of that of the usul al fiqh doctrines. Uh, and that is why I have written um, two chapters, perhaps, in this book, um, Sharia Law and Introduction. Chapter 6 is on the history and methodology of Maqasid, page 123 to 141. And this is the chapter I'll be using in my discussion today. There is also an occasional paper series published by uh, the Triple IT International Institute of Islamic Thought, based in London, Maqasid al Sharia Made Simple. This is also a 2010 publication, occasional paper series 13. Uh, there are also there are other references. Uh, some of my writings on the subject occur in different places. But uh, the Kuala Lumpur edition of my Principles of Islamic Jurisprudence also has a good chapter on the Maqasid. It is uh, also natural uh, to approach a subject by reference to the higher goals and objectives of the discipline we are about to study. Uh, the students and researchers of Islamic law also take interest uh, by mm, through the maqasid to know the, the sharia and make this a starting point what is the what are the intentions the, the objectives and the goals of sharia <coughs> in in its different parts uh, i would be uh, discussing the subject of any textual authority in the Quran and Sunnah, is there any uh, support for this, uh, for the maqasid of Sharia? Um, <clears throat> and then the history of juristic thought in contributions of prominent scholars to the subject. What is the definition of the maqasid? Uh, then the classification of maqasid. Uh, how are they identified, the identification of maqasid and the relevance of maqasid for ijtihad. 
And the last three, definition, classification, identification, and relevance to ijtihad. This, in other words, provides the uh, methodology of ijtihad. Um, <coughs> the maqasid al-sharia also represent a, a latent development in the, develop, uh, in, in the progress of, uh, of the history of Islamic thought. Um, the usul al-fiqh was more or less uh, at uh, its final stages of development by the end of the third century or ninth century common era. Um, um, but uh, the maqasid uh, started, in fact, uh, in uh, attracting the, uh, interest around 10th century common era well about uh, three or four centuries after the completion of Usul al-Fiqh. And there was a reason for that. And the Usul al-Fiqh as a, as a discipline of the Sharia is focused on text readings and semantics. And the literalist kind of orientation I have also earlier mentioned uh, of Usul al-Fiqh. Whereas the Maqasid is more um, theor theoretical, a little uh, philosophical, um, uh, asking questions as to the intention of the law, the underlying philosophy of legislation. And the uh, scholars of Usul al fiqh were uh, somewhat reluctant uh, to develop these kind of uh, philosophical themes, uh, although they have never denied the importance of the maqasid, uh, yet they have somehow not given it um, a high profile in the study of the sharia, which is why uh, there is some disagreement on, over the details of the methodology of the maqasid. Uh, the first time uh, the maqasid were mentioned by was by in the fourth uh, uh, or tenth century, Hijra references to the Maqasid were made by Tirmizi al Hakim. Um, and then uh, Al Juwaini, uh, Imam al Haramain, the teacher of Imam al Ghazali, uh, for the first time referred to this triple classification of the Maqasid, as I will be later discussing. And then Al-Ghazali identified the essential maqasid into five. And then uh, juristic thought developed uh, progressively on the subject. Uh, I will be discussing that, but before that, I will give one or two examples why the maqasid are uh, interesting, more direct, more relevant to the concerns of human life. Uh, and uh, issue questions. For example, there was this uh, with reference to the charity of Fitr on the occasion of Eid al-Fitr marking the fasting month of Ramadan. Muslims give a charity in the name of Fitr. Uh, in the Hadith literature, because uh, of uh, the fact that the staple food in the, of Medina in Mecca during the time of the Prophet were dates in wheats in Bali. Uh, references in Hadith to Sadaqat al-Fitr occur uh, in that you give it in kind. Uh, this Imam Abu Hanifa asked the question that uh, what if, we, if they are given in, in their monetary value in his fatwa in response to that question was that it is, uh, it is fine, it is valid to give the sadaqah of Peter in its monetary equivalent. Why? Because the purpose of giving charity is to address the issue of need in poverty. Uh, and uh, giving help to a needy person in monetary terms is equally acceptable. Uh, so if you find, if you follow the letter of the text, then you have to give it in kind. But if you follow the purpose, then this also opens a different avenue. Uh, 
in the Quran, another example, uh, there is a verse that when you, uh, when you see the moon, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الْشَهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْهُ When you see the new moon of Ramadan, then you start fasting. The text here uh, mentions eyesight. Is it therefore a, a requirement that uh, the moon must be sighted? Or can we um, perhaps uh, work on computation and uh, uh, the kind of uh, the calendar um, specification would be equally good? And a question has been raised and the answer given that it is equally valid. Um, it is not necessary that you must eyesight, sight the moon through eyesight. Through computation would be equally good. And finally, another example. You may apply the pun punishments. For example, the hat punishment of adultery or false accusation. There are textual, textually prescribed penalties for these offenses. There are times when uh, this is the normal course, when someone commits an offense, you apply the punishment. But there are times when it, this is not the best course. You either take the literalist approach of applying the hudud for the sake of the hudud, or you look at the objective of the purpose of what is the purpose of punishment. Uh, uh, if it is justice or reforming the individual, then that is the higher objective. So there is a difference between the literalist approach to the reading of Sharia and one which is goal-oriented, maqasid-oriented. Uh, is there any evidence in the Qur'an in support of the maqasid? Well, the Qur'an, it is said from beginning to end, is very much inclined uh, towards uh, identifying the goals and purposes of its of its ahkam of its laws, in many many ways references are given. Some of them are direct, others are indirect. Um, some of these objectives are very broad uh, and universal to the entire Sharia in Islam itself, like uh, compassion and mercy. Rahma, for example, in the Quran, Surah 10, uh, verse 57, identifies, characterizes the Quran as a healing to the spiritual ailment, ailments of the heart, in guidance, in Rahma, uh, in, in mercy for the believers. Uh, the Quran, this is the objective of the revelation of the Quran, in other words. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala characterized himself by his most beautiful names in two of the most uh, favorite of his own names are one is Ar-Rahman, the characterization of most beneficent and most merciful. This is once again the Prophet, uh, uh, the mission of the Prophet Muhammad is characterized as a message for the world in Surah 21, This is the great grand objective of Islam, of prophethood, of the Quran, the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala itself. And the larger other objectives of Islam is uh, respect for human dignity, uh, fulfillment of justice, of doing good to others, uh, good moral characteristics and trustworthiness. There is plenty of evidence in the sources in support of these being the higher objectives of Islam in the Sharia. More specifically, there are references in the Quran, for example, with reference to charity in Zakat. Uh, so that wealth is not concentrated only in the hands of the rich. And this is the purpose of charity in zakat. Um, the purpose and the objective of jihad, of, uh, of uh, struggle in the path of Allah, uh, is explained in another verse. Uh, 
because uh, those who are uh, permitted uh, to resort to fighting is because they were uh, subjected to oppression. So fighting oppression is the objective of jihad. Uh, then we have uh, In the law of retaliation, there is protection of life for you. The Quran explains, in other words, the objective of his own laws. Um, <coughs> In the Sunnah, there are many references. Some scholars have gone on record to say that uh, such references reach nearly 1,000. Uh, maybe uh, this is something uh, very characteristic of the Quran, not just uh, delivering the rules, the do's and don'ts, as we, as we have in parliamentary legislation Parliamentary legislation do not uh, uh, give any details as to objectives, as to the benefit, or, uh, or any, for example, uh, the higher goals or the appeal that the Quran also make to the reason in conscience of the believer. These are some of the aspects of the Quran that are goal oriented. Uh, we do not find this in, in parliamentary legislation. Uh, and uh, the Sunnah also, in many places, um, identifies the benefit, goal, the rationale, the purpose, sometimes the, the, the adverse consequences of a certain conduct. Uh, and these are the ways how the scholars would look at in order to identify the objectives uh, and the uh, uh, purposes of the ahkam of sharia. Uh, perhaps the whole uh, of this section, uh, the discussion the maqasid is uh, encapsulated by one hadith, al-umuru bi maqasidiha. The affairs of people are judged by reference to their objectives. Uh, Innam uh, al a similar hadith that uh, uh, people's actions are to be judged by reference to their underlying intentions. We have all of this in the Quran, yet the question still remains why did the maqasid uh, not find a prominent place in the, uh, in the doctrines and expositions of the usul al fiqh? I have already made a reference to it because of his orientation to philosophy and also to some extent the maqasid are as open to value judgment like the maslaha itself. Uh, and uh, the usul al-fiqh is somewhat reluctant to encourage such themes. It is uh, with reference to the definition of the maqasid. And the ulama of usul did not provide a definition, nor did they develop any methodology for the maqasid. Even uh, Imam al-Shatibi in uh, 14th century common era, uh, who was uh, the main advocate of the maqasid and wrote his four-volume work, Al-Muwafaqat, in which he developed the maqasid into a, a distinctive chapter of the sharia. Even he did not give a definition to the maqasid, although he actually penetrates the methodology of the maqasid and makes dis significant contributions for, to that end. Yet he did not define it, perhaps partly because some words are so distinctive in conveying their purpose, that you do not need a definition. The maqsad, the purpose, the objective of something is something that conveys a very clear meaning. But uh, 20th century scholars, Al 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 Fasi, uh, provided a definition uh, that uh, the maqasid, the goals and purposes of sharia, uh, refer to the wisdom. Uh, that the lawgiver has considered uh, in the enactment of all of his uh, 
rulings. Uh, this is briefly uh, the definition of the maqasid that uh, the wisdom uh, which may consist of benefit of uh, prevention of harm, uh, human welfare or whatever that may be that the lawgiver has considered, has intended in uh, authorizing, in issuing uh, the rules, the ahkam of sharia. There are other definitions, for example, uh, Tahir ibn Ashur has given, but I would not uh, go into the details of the definition as I have discussed it in my writings. But Ibn Ashur did characterize the maqasid uh, in four points. One, one that, uh, in, that the purpose and goal uh, of a hukum must be general, must be general in the sense that it applies to all the incidents uh, of its application. Um, <clears throat> and that it is uh, constant, uh, aam, and sabit. It does not change with, with the change of circumstances. It is firm and permanent. And that it is wahir or self-evident. You do not need to resort to interpretations and analysis for it. And it is tart. It is self-contained and exclusive that avoid confusion with other concepts. Uh, these are some of the characterization and definition of the maqasid. And uh, Ibn Tahir ibn Ashur book entitled Maqasid al-Shari'a al-Islamiyya was itself a significant contribution to this subject. Um, now I briefly look at uh, in the juristic contributions of the ulama to the subject. I mentioned earlier that the ulama and the scholars of jurisprudence uh, and the mazahib, they um, have acknowledged the importance of the maqasid, yet they have not penetrated for a long time. It remained a dormant subject. Um, and some um, contributions were made, but generally speaking, they were actually subsumed under other topics. And that the topics of, of effective cause or illa, sometimes um, with, mm, the, the, with regard to, for example, other topics like uh, general custom or orf, even analogy in qiyas, we see references to the maqasid, but not really giving it a degree of prominence. None of the earlier texts of Usul al-Fiqh, for example, have a chapter dedicated to the maqasid. Uh, the English texts that we have in 20th century also do not uh, subjects on Islamic jurisprudence textbooks uh, still uh, have that. Uh, I have included that in my writings, uh, but this is to say that uh, it was uh, a, a late comma uh, to um, the, in, in, the, in the development of uh, Islamic juristic thought. Uh, except for the Zwahiri ulama uh, who maintained that the maqasid uh, only exists if there is a clear text to say that this is the objective of the Sharia, then we recognize the existence of the maqasid. Otherwise, um, the Zwahiri school do not recognize the maqasid uh, as an independent aspect of the Sharia. Uh, all that we have are the text. Uh, if the text tells us that there is an objective, then he, there we stand. Otherwise, we will not formulate one to say that this is the text or this is the objective of the text. Also, the Batiniya or the Ismailiya, one uh, school of the Shia, uh, that they do not recognize the Maqasid. Um, there are others who have some reservations, but generally speaking, the Jumhur, the majority of ulama, not only look at the text of the Sharia, but also 
the objective, the rationale, <coughs> and the benefit and the other aspects of the text as, as well as the objectives and the purposes of the text is part of the reading of the ahkam of the sharia. This is the jumhur position. Yet within the ranks of the recognized school also we have um, certain um, shades of differences. Earlier I mentioned that uh, <coughs> ulama like uh, al-Ghazali, uh, al-Juwaini, they made a start on uh, the discussion of the maqasid and the triple identification of maqasid into the essential, supplementary, indesirable, uh, daruriyat, hajiyat, tahsiniyat. This occurs in the writings of al-Juwaini, the teacher of al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali then developed this, uh, the work of his teacher, then identified that the essential maqasid are five as we have referred to uh, protection of, uh, of the human self or life, protection of religion, protection of and promotion of property, of intellect, and of family in progeny. These are the essential maqasid. In masaleh, maqasid in masaleh, although they are not identical, but they are used interchangeably. <coughs> Maslaha in maqasid. They are very closely aligned, and yet there are some differences. I have developed this in my writing that the maqasid have a degree of permanence to it. Maslaha is very circumstantial. The maqasid are not. They have a, 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 a permanence, a degree above um, that uh, can justify the validity of the maslaha itself. Uh, but these uh, classification, the triple classification, have also been taken in the discussion of the maqasid. Um, Fakhruddin al-Razi, uh, a Quran commentator, 13th century common era, also Saifuddin al-Amidi, a 13th century uh, jurist of Usul al-Fiqh, uh, they consider uh, maqasid as a criteria of the preference of one qiyas over another. You see quite a law profile. Um, <clears throat> then uh, Al-Qarafi, the Maliki jurist, Shahabuddin Al-Qarafi, identified uh, an additional maqsid or purpose in addition to the five that Al-Ghazali identified, and this is the dignity and honor protection and promotion of the honor and dignity of the individual is also one of the essential objectives of Islam and its Sharia. This was supported by later in 14th century uh, Wahabuddin al-Subki uh, and, uh, uh, and then um, al-Shawkani in the 19th century. Uh, they supported Al-Qarafi's uh, uh, identification of ayrd or dignity. Um, why was it uh, this identification related numbered at five or six? Actually, there is some connection between the maqasid and the punishments of the hudud, the prescribed penalties, because the prescribed penalties identify in a negative sense, imposing punishment for a value that you want to defend, to protect, whether it is property, whether it is life, whether it is honor. They arose in a way the maqasid were extracted from the text reading of the Quran on the subject of the hudud. Whether this was uh, uh, the correct approach or not, that is, uh, perhaps some what later I will refer to when I review um, some other contributions of the scholars. Um, Isuddin Abdus Salam, a 13th century Shafi jurist, he went on record in his uh, renowned book, Qawaid al Ahkam fi Maswalih al Anam, the essentials of the Ahkam uh, for the 
benefit of the people. Um, characteristic, even bringing the idea of benefits into the title of his renowned work. He said that, that God the Most High, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not enact a sharia in order to benefit himself. He is above that. So the only other thing remaining is that the Sharia is revealed from beginning to end to realize uh, welfare and benefit for human beings. Um, in other words, the higher objective, a uh, maqsid of the Sharia, the mega objective is human welfare. And then we have in the 14th century uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, the prominent Hanbali jurist, uh, who raised this question, an important question, asked this question. Why are we saying that the maqasid are five or six in number? Look at the Quran. The Quran uh, tells us that there are more than just a specific number of goals and objectives the Sharia vindicates and protects. Um, on the subject of uh, honesty and truthfulness, on the subject of purity, in terms of cleanliness, in terms of purity of character, uh, uh, for example, respect for one's parents, being observant of the kind of, of the ties of kinship, and uh, um, even kindness and respect for one's neighbors. Uh, there is so much evidence for all of these and more. Uh, are they not the objectives in maqasid of sharia? If they are, then maqasid is an open chapter, it's an evolving chapter, and not necessarily enumerated in any order, five or six. It was an important development in the history of the Maqasid. Ibn Taymiyyah's view has actually been taken in by 20 uh, prominent uh, uh, scholars of Sharia in our times and earlier on. And the contemporary scholar Yusuf al Qaradawi, for example, he has identified the social support, takaful, uh, to those in need. The society has a responsibility to support them. Takaful is one of the objectives of the Sharia. The Quran is full of this support, whether charity, obligatory, or, or optional for the poor and health. That is one. He also adds that uh, protection of the freedom, personal freedom and liberty of the individual is one of the objectives of Islam. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Al-Raisuni, Al-Jabiri, uh, and uh, others who have uh, mentioned, for example, uh, human dignity and justice uh, also being the objectives of Sharia. In Jamaluddin Atiyah added uh, and mentioned 24 maqasid. Those, and they occur in four categories. Those uh, which uh, are of interest to the individual, uh, to the family, uh, to the ummah, the Muslim community, and to the humanity at large. Uh, he identifies a large number of maqasid uh, in these four areas and totaling at 24. In my writing, I have also added in our time, pursuit of peace, of international world peace, is one of the higher objectives of Islam in its Sharia. And uh, um, R&D research, in research and development, the dignity and standing of the Ummah and international community depends on its inventiveness and contribution to science. Uh, in technology. So in our times we can say this is part of the ilm uh, which is one of the maqasid. Um, and perhaps uh, uh, protecting the fundamental rights and liberties as are expounded in contemporary readings of our constitutions. These are also important and uh, we can uh, perhaps uh, identify these, most of these, uh, as part of the maqasid of Sharia. Um, <clears throat> and then I move on to the classification of the maqasid. I have already uh, 
mentioned, the triple classification, uh, which signifies the relative merit of the maqasid into essential maqasid, which are five or six, as I mentioned, those which are supplementary. The supplementary maqasid, which are known as hajiyat, they refer to the second order objectives in terms of importance. For example, uh, cleanliness and purity, giving charity in sadaqah beyond its uh, uh, minimum or limits, uh, certain types of uh, contracts that the Sharia has validated uh, despite some abnormality that may exist in the concessions that we have in all areas, whether it is performance of salat or hajj or, uh, or other duties, uh, there are concessions granted for certain situations and individuals. These are part of the supplementary maqasid. And then and the more open category of tahsiniyat, those which are desirable. Um, compassion to animals, for example, being pleasant and, and polite, uh, having a pleasant encounter, have a good word to say to people. These are part of the tahsiniyat. And there is, we have, for example, one hospital in a particular district. You try to develop this to bring better facilities, to build a second hospital, to bring specialized services. This is the essential aspect of health needs you have answered. But now we are engaged in bringing all that is desirable, that enhances upon what is essential upon what is supplementary. Now, in our times, actually, it is mainly this aspect of development, whether economic, whether uh, of science and technology, is basically the area of the tahsiniyat we are engaged in, in most cases. Then another classification of the maqasid is simple, into two categories, definitive, and speculative, qat'i and zwanni. Qat'i are those which are supported by clear text in the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, uh, like we said, these five or six uh, essential maqasid are those which are known by the general reading of the Quran and Hadith or known through general consensus and ijma. The speculative or zwanni objectives are those uh, that uh, are less um, evident, like a certain area of knowledge, one has to acquire the knowledge of a fusul al-fiqh itself, for example. Is it an essential maqasid? One doesn't know. Uh, no. Liquor is prohibited, of course, but whether a small amount that does not intoxicate is also inhibit, prohibited to the same, the same sense. This is something that one doesn't know quite whether this is a, a qati or zwanni. Uh, but the a con general consensus or ijma has this function that raises the level of identification of values from the level of speculative to the level of definitive. When consensus throws its support, it raises the ranking. Another classification of maqasid is into the am in the khas, the general in the specific. The general objectives of sharia in Islam are those which permeates the entire sharia in Islam itself, like uh, the objectives of justice, human dignity, uh, consultative government, for example, consultation itself and uh, prevention, alleviation of harm. In every area of the Sharia, this remains the general objective. Uh, but uh, those which are more particular may be identified with reference, for example, to sale. What is the objective of sale? It's transfer of ownership. What is the objective of giving testimony? It's to establish the truth. Um, these are the specific objectives. Another classification is uh, 
مقاصد أصلية مقاصد طبيعية original مقاصد in supplementary مقاصد the original مقاصد are those that are essential to the أحكام of the شريعة in the first order what is the original purpose of of علم of acquisition of knowledge it is knowledge of God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the manner of worshipping him what is the objective of marriage it is procreation of the human being these are the original the sharia as has identified these are objective but tabiya um, subsidiary maqasid for example in the for marriage in addition to procreation, it's sexual gratification, companionship, uh, so on. These are subsidiary maqasid. <coughs> Al-Shatibi has lastly added another classification of maqasid, which is um, those of the lawgiver, identified by the lawgiver, in those which are identified by those that are uh, related to the in human beings themselves. Um, the lawgiver general objective is human welfare behind the ahkam of the sharia, for example. Uh, but um, uh, the mukallaf human being may have additional objective for their activities, for example, of uh, gaining knowledge. It may be to acquire a certain skill or a diploma, or a certain type of work or employment. These are the maqasid of the mukallaf. The purpose of these classification is to make the task a little easier when we try to uh, determine the priority of which over which. Should there be a conflict between the various maqasid, then and this would help us to identify that this takes priority over the other. And uh, uh, it is important to read the ahkam of sharia together with the objective and the purpose of the sharia. When there is a distance developing between the two, there is distortion. Um, even the prayer, if the purpose, the, prayer, the purpose of prayer is submission to our creator. But one who prays in a public place for reason of hypocrisy and so on, that prayer is, counts for nothing. You see the importance of the purpose together with the hukum. Uh, and um, uh, if there be a difficulty in identifying the correct order, we refer to consensus and to special. The next question I raise is with regard to the identification of the maqasid. Uh, this relates to the question of uh, weaknesses in the methodology of maqasid. And here we are making progress on that methodology. How is it identified? How do we know that this or that is an objective of the sharia? The first approach taken is that we look at the clear text, the nusus of the Qur'an and Sunnah. In this I have mentioned, uh, and Al-Shatibi adds, provided that the, the text is uh, original and it is explicit. Tasrihi ibtidai. It is not supplementary to another text and it is not uh, uh, open to doubt and speculation. Uh, then uh, uh, also the areas of commands and prohibition is uh, where we can look for the maqasid uh, when we look into the Quran and Sunnah. <coughs> um, Al-Shatibi, the principal uh, advocate of the maqasid, uh, says this, that uh, uh, the maqasid, commands and prohibition, is always to be given priority in, we look at these in the first place. Um, but it is not enough. Uh, we also look at the objective, rationale, the purpose, uh, 
of uh, the ahkam of sharia together with uh, the actual text reading um, and this is of course uh, a step away from uh, the kind of uh, uh, the approach that was taken by Imam al Shafi. Uh, ishtihad, uh, an innovative uh, thought and interpretation according to al Shafi, is confined to the text, and after the text, it is analogy or qiyas. And qiyas itself has uh, speculative components. Uh, in early uh, in the early times of development of Islamic jurisprudence, this was a highly disputed subject, Qiyas. Uh, when you read the text of the Quran on the subject of wine drinking, first the question arose, Ijtanibuhu, avoid it. Is it a prohibition or is it only educational, a certain advice? Khamr, for example, the word that occur in the text, in the language of the Arabs, refer to that kind of wine that is extracted from liquor, from, from grapes. The question arose whether other substances are also included. And then, of course, uh, <coughs> whether this uh, prohibition was confined uh, to uh, the Arab society of the time, is it permanent, whether a small amount and a large amount are fall under the same ruling, and of course, the four pillars of Qiyas and each of them have conditions to fulfill. This is a long route towards Ijtihad. The other approach that al Shafi, that al Shatibi advocate is the Maqasid oriented approach towards the reading of the Ahkam in the Ijtihad itself. The mega purpose of the Maqasid is human welfare in Maslaha, also Hikmah or wisdom behind the ahkam. And uh, um, uh, also that we read uh, in our effort to identify the objectives of Sharia, pay more attention to the asbab al-nuzul, the occasions of the revelation. This is an area which has to some extent been not given a degree of prominence in the earlier writing if you compare that to what Fazlur Rahman writes about the importance of the occasions of revelation. This gives us a certain understanding of the purpose, original purpose of the rulings of Sharia and it is a, a, a useful tool for the identification of the Maqasid. Um, <coughs> For the most part, al Shatibi says that the, the nusus, that the textual injunctions of the Quran and Sunnah convey their objectives also without any difficulty. We understand that. Uh, but then beyond the nusus, he raises a question that at times there are references to certain value points and objectives, although we don't have a clear injunction on that. And there is a number of references in the Quran, for example, but none of it is by way of a clear text. Uh, can we uh, extract the maqasid or the objective, a certain objective, from our general reading of the text? And that is the contribution, the main contribution of al Shatibi to the methodology of the maqasid. This is inductive reasoning or istiqra. At times, we have several texts. None is uh, decisive. But the collective reading in weight of the text leave us in no doubt that this is an objective of the Sharia. For example, we know that, uh, that five or six uh, of uh, the essential, uh, of the maqasid are essential, or how do we know it? There is no clear text either in the Quran or Sunnah to tell us that this is so. But we know this from our general reading. Uh, and this is a definitive conclusion. Similarly, we classify them into three main cut in several other classifications. There is no text on that, but we know this is the case. Uh, we have, for example, um, 
the general uh, understanding that uh, ibadat, matters of worship, are not uh, subject to ijtihad. Uh, uh, how do we know this? There is no clear text on this, but our general reading of the nusus tell us that it is a definitive conclusion. So istiqra or inductive reasoning uh, is a method, a tool for the identification of the maqasid. Not can only not only identifying a certain purpose or, or objective, but also commands and prohibition can be identified through the inductive approach. Um, uh, should there be, uh, we said that the decisive injunction, commands and prohibitions, and now we say a general reading. These are the way of identification of the maqasid. But I raise a question toward the end of this discussion uh, that uh, in our times there are all sorts of questions in the context of legislation and uh, may arise. Should there be persistent doubt, then we should refer to consultation, whether it is uh, parliamentary or other level of consultation and specialist opinion and ijtihad that may also help the identification of the maqasid. And finally, my, uh, my discussion is the importance of the maqasid for ijtihad. Al-Shatibi and many other scholars went on record to say that uh, a mujtahid, a scholar and jurist of Sharia, must be knowledgeable uh, of, the, um, of the objectives, the goals and purposes of the Sharia. Anyone who neglects that will do so to his own peril. You look at the approaches, uh, the understanding of the companions of the Sharia, it's very, very purpose oriented and uh, that is that we must retain the spirit of that approach that we should look always uh, the, at the general and the more specific um, objectives behind of the rulings of Sharia. <coughs> Sometimes among the Khawarij in the Ahl al bidah and those uh, who um, indulge in pernicious innovations and they give preference to the doubtful aspects of the Quran over those which were more clear, the mutashabihat for example, over the muhkamat. Um, <coughs> and the Sharia according to the majority of ulama is a unity, an integrated unity that follows certain distinctive purposes and we should always keep in sight of these. Uh, Tahir ibn Ashur, a 20th century scholar, supports this line of discussion and uh, his advice is it be a, a mistake uh, to indulge into this uh, reading of the Ahkam away from his objectives. Here he gives examples. Some of the early scholars have also made errors. Imam Malik, a very prominent uh, alim, of course, an imam, uh, he was asked a question about a person who pays a zakat ahead of time. Does he need to pay to when the time comes? And he thought about it. Uh, he said, he drew an analogy with the prayer or salat. Salat, if it is offered ahead of this time, should be repeated. He gave the same by way of analogy, the same answer to zakat. This was mistaken. Of course, the purposes uh, are different. Uh, I have already mentioned that sometimes in the area of punishments, it's not the punishment, but uh, some other objective that is more meaningful, like uh, the granting pardon. Uh, in the area of contracts, sometimes when you apply a contract literally, it situation changes and it in, amounts to injustice and unfairness. And then the judge and the jurist look at the objectives and make the necessary changes so that the idea of greater, the larger maqasid, fairness, justice, is brought in to, into the meaning of the contract. Uh, we discussed the idea of qiyas and istihsan, analogy 
in juristic preference. We set aside a certain analogy uh, and bring an alternative ruling in its place because of for a certain purpose. It's all a maqasid-oriented approach. We mm, further read that uh, maqasid and ijtihad are relevant. Uh, we pay attention also to the consequences of uh, conduct and of rulings. Like uh, the Prophet ﷺ himself has done that. Uh, at one time, his, wa his wife, the Aisha, Siddiqa, asked the Prophet, why don't you change the actual place of the Kaaba? The Kaaba was not on the place where uh, Ibrahim, the Prophet Ibrahim, had initially built it. The Arabs had changed it. Uh, the Prophet's answer to that said, I would have done that, but my fear is that people will be misguided and will sway them into disbelief. So he was looking at the consequences. Even something would have been right to do, but the purpose, the consequences did not permit it. Um, uh, there is this uh, uh, Al Shatibi has given an advice to the judges. They look, of course, at the purpose and rationale of rulings, in, but sometimes there is something more to uh, consider. Um, a witness, when a witness is upright, he becomes admissible. Uh, his testimony has become admissible. But uh, when you look at to the particular individual as a witness, in some other perhaps episode or story that is attached to that individual, even if it's a, a upright, the judge may not accept him. This is something that is uh, very much uh, purpose-oriented, uh, has to do with ijtihad, has to do with insight in the reading of the objectives of the Sharia. and. Uh, uh, it, it is an important tool for ijtihad. Uh, the mujtahid uh, should have comprehensive knowledge, not only of the readings of the injunctions in the ahkam of sharia, but the objectives that they uh, in, incorporate into their constructive and innovative thought in ijtihad. Thank you.